and welcome everybody. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Professor Peter Flew. Um, I'm chair of the Dance School Safeguarding Working Group, uh, and as a day job, I am Dean of the School of Education at the University of Roehampton. Um, you're very welcome. This is the second of our uh, DBS webinars. Um, just a little thing about the working group. We've been going for two years now. We are uh, an, an informal working group that works with um, and from outside the dance school industry to try and improve safeguarding, to raise awareness, to lobby uh, for uh, various changes that we may wish. Um, anybody who's not a member of the group, everyone's welcome to join. There's no fee, there's no income, it's not a company. Uh, we're just here to share good practice uh, and to volunteer where we can. Um, you can email me at uh, uh, Roehampton, which I'll put the um, email address in the chat and I'll put on our, our website details in the chat as well. So we have, uh, we're very, very happy to welcome Cathy Taylor back uh, from the Disclosure and Barring Service uh, for this, our second uh, conversation. The first one is up on the Safer Dance YouTube channel, uh, which is also accessed from our website as well. Um, Cathy is the Regional Outre Outreach Manager for the Disclosure and Barring Service. Uh, she's part of the partnerships team and manages the team of regional outreach advisors who support organisations across England, Wales and Northern Ireland with DBS processes and legislation. She also supports partnerships with national organisations across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Prior to working for DBS, Cathy's worked in the voluntary sector, supporting workforce development, developing and delivering training to the children's workforce, supporting families with preschool children and children who've been impacted by domestic abuse. She's also been a children's centre manager employed by a local authority and has been a member of a local safeguarding children's board training team. Uh, welcome, Cathy. Um, you'll be speaking for uh, an hour, hour and 10 minutes, and then there'll be a chance for questions. If you have any comments that you think of and you uh, want to form, put something in the chat, please do. If you have any questions, could you put them in the chat, uh, not the Q&A? Um, Erin uh, Sanchez from One Dance UK will be uh, monitoring that and um, uh, supporting me as we get towards the end. And I'll hand over to Cathy. Oh, thank you very much, Peter. So uh, hello again to those that I've met before and for those that I've not met. Lovely to meet you. I'll just share my screen with you um, to show you my presentation. Okay. So welcome, everybody. If you'd like to pop in the chat box where you're from, that's really useful to get a bit of introductions because it's too big a group to go around to find out who everybody is. So if you just want to do that while I'm talking about housekeeping, that would be great. So um, as Peter said, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat box and Erin Aaron will have a look at those. And at the end of the session, we will look to answer them. Please remember there's no such thing as a silly question. If you're asking the question, probably someone else in the group would like to know the answer as well. If I can't answer the question today, what I will do is I will take it away and go back to the other experts within DBS to get an answer for your question. Um, if we can just think about confidentiality, we're all from different groups and organisations and we're talking about quite sensitive subjects. So if you do want to talk about a particular case, can you please contact me offline because I won't be able to talk about it in public. I don't have access to case files or anything like that, so I wouldn't be able to talk to you about individual cases today. Um, if you want to bring up any scenarios, please make them so that there's no identifying information in there. Uh, if you can keep your microphones off, that unless you're talking, that's great, just so we can limit any background noise. We do have a captions feature. Um, so if you click on the bottom of your screen and you go to more, you'll be able to pull up the captions there. I always say, please feel free to do it. But unfortunately, Zoom sometimes doesn't understand my Scout accent, so it can always be a bit of a comedy of errors when the captions are on. Um, the slides will be available at the end of the session. I will pass those on to the Safer Dance team and they will circulate those. So don't worry about having to furiously scribble down notes during this presentation. Okay. So our objectives for today are to understand the benefits of DBS and your organisation working together. We're going to look at the three different referral routes that DBS get borrowing referrals for. 
but we're going to really concentrate in today on discretionary referrals because they're the referrals that you're likely to bring to our attention. We're going to look at when a bar and referral should be made, including when the legal duty to make a bar and referral is met. We're going to briefly cover what regulated activity is because that's one of the conditions um, of when a person is barred that they've had to either be working or looking to work in regulated activity. So some of that information is the same information that you will have seen on the eligibility workshop, but we'll just have a really quick recap. Then we're going to think about how to make a good quality referral. And then we're going to think about what are the consequences of not making appropriate referrals and the consequences for an individual being included on one or both of the barred lists. So just a bit of an introduction for you. So the DBS has a five year strategy and that details our ambitions up to 2025. Um, and it focuses on three key elements, which are our profile, our people and quality. The strategy deals with the number of actions that we've been taking over the past two and a bit years and what we'll be doing in the next two and a half years as well. So our work provides significant protections to the public and the delivery of our DBS strategy will enable us to develop as an organisation, improve the services that we provide and support the contribution we make within the safeguarding community. So our purpose is to protect the public by helping employers make safer recruitment decisions and by barring individuals who pose a risk to vulnerable groups from working in certain roles. So if you would like to, when you get the slides, you can click on the hyperlink here and you can look at our business plan for 2022 to 2023, if that's something you would be interested in. Okay, so what is the role of the DBS? And that's a question we get asked lots. So, the DBS is responsible for the delivery of disclosure and barring functions on behalf of the government. So we operate the disclosure functions, which are your DBS certificates for England, Wales and the islands. If you live in Scotland, disclosure functions are covered by Disclosure Scotland and in Northern Ireland, they are covered by Access NI. But um, because the disclosure functions by all of our organisations, use the police national computer, no matter where you live in England, Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland, the same type of information will be disclosed on your certificates. We also operate the barring functions for England, Wales and Northern Ireland under the Safeguard of Vulnerable Groups Act 2006, the Safeguard of Vulnerable Groups Northern Ireland Order 2007 and the Protections of Freedoms Act 2012. So in Scotland, the barring functions are managed by Disclosure Scotland. So the barring functions are two lists that bar people from working, volunteering, seeking to work or volunteering, or offering to work or volunteer with children or adults in regulated activity. So these are two lists where people who are on these lists aren't allowed to be in regulated activity with children or adults. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about this a bit later on. If you are barred in England, Wales or Northern Ireland, you are also barred in Scotland. And if you're barred in Scotland, you are also barred in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So today we're going to do a little bit of a quiz to wake everybody up after lunch. And we're going to look at some statements around barring and the legal duty to make referrals to the DBS. And I would like you to pop into the chat box whether you think these statements are true or false. And Erin will give me a bit of a summary about what people think, and then I'll go through the answers with you. So our first question is, there's been a concern with an employee which I've reported to the police Therefore, a DBS referral isn't needed. Do you think this one is true or false? Hopefully everyone's furiously typing away. 
I just want to triple check and make sure that all of the attendees can access the chat. So if someone can't access the chat, could you please, uh, I see someone saying that the chat is disabled. Um, so just bear with me one second. I'll see if I can uh, uh, address that. Okay, so what I'm going to need to do is just um, uh, change a couple of things with the settings. Um, if you can just bear with me for one minute, um, you all the attendees will see a change to their uh, access, which should allow them to access the chat. Just bear with me one second. While Erin's doing that, what I'll do is I'll give you the answer to this one. So there's been a concern with employee, which I've reported to the police. Therefore, a DBS referral isn't needed. So the answer to this one is false. It's essential that DBS is informed of all scenarios where the referring organisation has some evidence that an individual has posed a risk of harm, even if the organisation has informed the police of the situation and no further action was taken. And this is because the burden of proof for the police and the Crown Prosecution Service requires that there's sufficient evidence to be able to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that an individual has committed a certain act or behaved in a certain way. However, in order to make a decision to place an individual on the barred list, the DBS only requires enough evidence to prove that on the balance of probability, a person has committed the act. So it's more than likely than not to have occurred. If the police do charge an individual, they would not automatically inform the DBS of this. Therefore, it's really important that a referral to the DBS is made because quite often the police will not know a person's job role or if they're volunteering. So if you meet the legal duty to make a referral, please make a referral to us, even if you've informed the police. OK. So, Erin, have we managed to... It should be that several more people can access the chat. I'm just still moving others over. So All right. um, no most problem. of them or some of them should be able to access the chat now. Okay. So our next one is, I've reported the abuse to the regulator or keeper of register. Therefore, a referral to the DBS isn't needed. So again, this is a really similar question to question one. So the answer to this one is false. So although the regulator, so for example, your regulator might be Ofsted, it could be the teacher regulatory authority, they may or they may not inform the DBS of a case. It doesn't happen as a matter of course. The legal duty to make a referral sits with the regulated activity provider or personnel supplier. So even if the individual is banned from working within their sector, it doesn't prevent them from working in future with children or with vulnerable adults in regulated activity. So our next one is, although the individual has resigned from their role and can't cause any other harm within this regulated activity provider, I still need to make a referral to DBS. So I don't know whether people have got access to the chat box yet. If you do, do you want to pop in true or false for me? So it looks like most people are saying the answer to this one is true. Yes, it is true. And that is because even if a person's resigned from their role and can't cause any other harm within the regulated activity provider, they could still go off and cause harm outside in a different role or a voluntary role. 
And also when we look at the conditions to make a referral to the EBS, the first one is you've made, withdrawn permission for a person to engage in regulated activity with children or vulnerable adults, or you move a person to another area of work that isn't regulated activity. So this could include situations where you would have dismissed a person, but they've already resigned or you've redeployed them. So our next question is, the DBS will only include individuals on the barred list, child and or adult, if they've been cautioned or convicted of a serious offence. What do you think? I think that one is true or false. Seems like most people are saying false to this one. Yeah, so this one is false. So the DBS do include individuals in one or both of the barred lists if they've been cautioned or convicted of a relevant offence. And they are offences that are set out in law which require a referral to be made to the DBS. However, we will consider discretionary referrals and disclosure information. So the discretionary referrals are those referrals that we rely on people like yourselves to bring to our attention. And disclosure information is information that comes to light when an individual applies for an enhanced check with a check of one or both barred lists. And we will talk about this a little bit later on in the presentation. So it is possible for individuals who've got no cautions or convictions to be included on the child and or adult part list. I'm only able to make a referral to the DBS if the legal duty to do so is met. Do you think this is true or false? It looks like we've got a bit of disagreement here. So some people saying true, some people saying false. So with this one, it's actually false. So even if the legal duty to refer is not met, you can, if you think it's appropriate, make a referral to the DBS in the interest of safeguarding children or vulnerable adults. So the DBS are required by law to consider any and all information that's sent to us from any source. And this includes information sent where the legal duty to make a referral doesn't apply. If you want to make a referral to the GBS where the legal duty doesn't apply, you should do so in consideration of relevant employment and data protection laws. And you might want to seek your own legal advice in relation to these cases. So examples of where we've had referrals where the legal duty to refer isn't met is where an organisation has dismissed somebody for safeguarding reasons, and this individual wasn't in regulated activity with themselves, but they were aware that they were volunteering in regulated activity with another organisation. So they were concerned that the harm that they committed in their job where it wasn't regulated activity could have been transferred to the role where it was. So that's some examples about when we would make referrals, even if the legal duty to do so wasn't met. So the DBS can only consider including an individual in one or both barred lists if they've caused direct harm to a child or vulnerable adult in their care whilst they are working in regulated activity. looks like we have consensus on this one we feel that it's false yeah so this one is false so the legislation around legal duty and relevant conduct includes 
if the conduct was repeated against or in relation to a child or adult, it would endanger the child or vulnerable adult or be likely to endanger the child or vulnerable adult. Therefore, you could have someone who's committed harm outside of their regulated activity role against someone who'd not be deemed a child or vulnerable adult. However, if it was repeated against a child or vulnerable adult, it would likely endanger them. So that's thinking about, well, how are people in regulating activity acting outside of their role? But we also have what we call the harm test. And then we, when we're looking at the harm test, we're looking at has something caused a child or adult to be harmed, put a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm, attempted to harm a child or vulnerable adult, or incited another to harm a child or vulnerable adult. Therefore, direct harm to a child or vulnerable adult doesn't need to have occurred for the DBS to consider including them in one or both of the barred lists. Okay. So thank you for doing the quiz there. Hopefully you've got a bit of knowledge now around the process. So we're going to go into the details about barring and the legal duty to refer now. So as you can see on the screen, and as mentioned briefly in the quiz, we receive barring referrals in three ways. So the first one we're going to look at is that discretionary referral. And they're the type of referrals that we are relying on people like yourselves to bring to our attention. And these referrals are when someone contacts the GBS because they've got concerns that an individual may have harmed a child or vulnerable adult or put a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm. We can get referrals from employers, agencies, keepers of registers, supervisory authorities, but we're not limited to getting referrals from these sources. We can get them from any sources. On the box, you can see a little triangle, which said, well, a little arrowy box that says representations. And what I mean by representations is if we're thinking about putting someone on one or both of the barred lists, we will ask them to give us representations. So to tell us why they shouldn't be placed on one or both of the barred lists. So if someone is referred to us by a discretionary referral in all cases, they can tell us why they shouldn't be placed on one or both barred lists. The next one we have is the auto bar referral route. And this is where someone is convicted of or cautioned for an automatic inclusion event, offence. And these are serious offences which are already set out in law and they require the GBS to bar the individual from regulated activity within the relevant workforce. So we do have auto bars without representations and these are really serious crimes where we wouldn't consider any reasons why they shouldn't be barred. And then we have auto bars with representation and they're crimes where we'd look at saying, well, yes, you can tell us why you shouldn't be placed on both one or both barred lists. And these representation situations are already set out in law. And the final route that we get referrals for looking at whether a person should be barred or not is the disclosure information route. And this is when information comes to light because an individual has applied for an enhanced check with a check of one or both barred lists. And this is because the individual is looking to work or volunteer in regulated activity. We would look at, well, are there any convictions, cautions or police intelligence? which would lead us to think we should consider barring this person from working in regulated activity. And in all cases here, we would take representations. So one of the biggest misconceptions about barring is that when you're placed on the barred list, you're placed on it for a certain amount of time. So this isn't true. So if a person is placed on the barred list, they are placed on the barred list for life. They can request a review, but they can only do that after a certain length of time and if certain conditions are met. So if you are placed on the barred list when you're under 18, you would have to wait a year before you could request a review. If you're 18 to 24, you'd have to wait five years. And if you were 25 or over, you would have to wait 10 years. And you have to meet conditions and really demonstrate there's been a change in circumstances, which no longer mean that you are a risk to children or vulnerable adults. There can be ma appeals made, um, and we'll talk a bit about that a bit later on as well. 
So who has the legal duty to make referrals? So there are legal duties for organisation to make referrals to GBS when certain conditions have been met. And we will cover these shortly. As I said in the quiz, the legal duty to refer applies even when a report has been made to another body, such as the local authority, safeguarding team, and the duty to refer applies irrespective of whether another body has made a referral to the GBS in relation to the same person. A person who is under the duty to refer and fails to refer to us without reasonable justification is actually committing an offence and you can be confined, you can be fined up to £5,000 for not making a referral. However, if it comes to light that an organisation hasn't made a referral, you're more likely to get um, a phone call from my team and we'll talk to you about the legal duty to refer and support you in how to make referrals in the future. So, under the Safeguard and Vulnerable Groups Act, two people have, or two groups of people have the legal duty to make a referral to GPS. The first one is if you are deemed to be a regulated activity provider. And these are employers or voluntary organisations who are responsible for the management or control of regulated activity and make arrangements for people to work in regulated activity. So to put this simply, if you've got anyone working or volunteering for you that has an enhanced with child or adult board list check, you are going to be a regulated activity provider. And then we have personnel suppliers. So these are employment businesses, employment agencies, or educational institutions that make arrangements with a person with a view to supplying that person to employers to undertake regulated activity. So to put a little bit more simply, it's organisations such as care supply agencies, teacher supply agencies, universities can sometimes be personnel suppliers if they are supplying students to carry out work placements in regulated activities. So for example, teaching students or medical students. So these are regulated activity providers and personnel suppliers. And if you are one of these, you have the legal duty to make a referral to the DBS. So what is the first condition to make a referral to us at the DBS? And the first condition is you have withdrawn permission for the individual to engage in regulated activity. So if you dismiss someone from your organisation, that's pretty straightforward because they're no longer going to be acting under your employment or volunteering. So they will no longer be carrying out regulated activity. Then we get redeployed. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because you might not have dismissed the person, but you might have moved them to another area of the organisation or business where they're no longer carrying out regulated activity. If you've made this decision and this is going to be a permanent decision, you would then have withdrawn permission for them to engage in regulated activity by redeploying them. If someone is retiring or they've been made redundant or they've been or they've resigned, quite often organizations will go brilliant, problem solved, they're out of our business now. We don't have to do anything about them. We've always got to remember that even if a person's retired, they've been made redundant or they've resigned, they could still go on to another organisation and still commit harm. So what we always say is if you know are committing or you're doing an investigation and the person retires, is made redundant or resigns, you should always complete your investigation and make that decision that if they hadn't retired, they hadn't been made redundant or they hadn't resigned, would you have removed them from regulated activity? If the answer is yes, you've met, met that first condition about making a referral to DBS. So we often get asked the question, what do we do when a person is suspended and we're still carrying out an investigation? We would say that suspension doesn't meet this main condition because until you've made that decision, they might still come back and engage in regulated activity. However, we would say if there's a bail scenario where you're hindered in making a dismissal, 
because of the, the police have told you to wait until the case has gone to prosecution. In those cases, you could still make a referral to us. So if you have a situation like that, please give us a call and we'll be able to give you a little bit more help and advice. So we know that you need to make a referral if you remove someone from regulated activity. So now I'm just gonna briefly cover what regulated activity is so you would know this. So regulated activity is with children providing healthcare and that only needs to be done once to become regulated activity and providing personal care and that only needs to be done once to become regulated activity. So with healthcare, the definition of healthcare is healthcare provided by a healthcare professional or someone acting under their direct supervision. Personal care is where help is provided with eating, drinking because the child is ill or has a disability or where help is provided with toileting, washing and dressing because of a child's age, illness or disability. Then we have unsupervised teaching, training and instruction, unsupervised caring for or supervising with children, providing advice or guidance on physical, emotional or educational well-being. If these things are happening more than three days in a 30 day period or once overnight with the opportunity for contact between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., they fall into regulated activity with children. And then we have driving children under an arrangement or moderating a web based service. If they happen more than three days in a 30 day period, that is regulated activity. And also, if you are a day to day manager of staff in regulated activity, you're also regarded to be in regulated activity. When we look at um, as well regulated activity with children, we need to think about where the activity takes place. So if the activity takes place in a school, a nursery, a children's home, a children's centre, a childcare premises or a children's hospital in Wales or detention centres for children, and an individual is working there more than three days in a 30 day period or overnight between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. and has the opportunity for contact with children in the establishment and works there for the purpose of the establishment. And it's not an occasional or temporary role or a supervised volunteer role. They would also be considered to be a regulated activity, even if they weren't doing one of the activities listed on the previous slide. So that's regulated activity with children. And then if we look at regulated activity with adults, it's a lot simpler because these things only need to be done once to become regulated activity with adults. We have providing healthcare, and that is the same definition as it is with children. We have providing personal care, and the definition of personal care with adults is slightly different because it includes supporting or prompting somebody with washing, drinking, eating, toileting, care of hair, skin, or nails for healthcare reasons because of their age, illness, or disability. We have social work, assistance with day-to-day -day financial running of an adult's own household, assistance for the conduct of an adult's affair and conveying an adult. So these are regulated activities with adults. So if an individual is doing any of these things with children or adults, they fall into regulated activity. Therefore, the legal duty to refer that first condition is met if you remove them. So the second condition to think about is, why have you dismissed this person from regulated activity? Why have you removed them? And if you've removed them because you think they've either engaged in relevant conduct or they've satisfied the harm test, or you know they've received a caution or a conviction or been convicted for one of those relevant offences, you've then met the two conditions where you have a legal duty to make a referral to the, the DBS. So what do we mean by relevant conduct? By relevant conduct, we mean conduct that endangers or is likely to endanger, or conduct if it was repeated against or in relation to a child or adult would endanger them or be likely to endanger them. It's also really important to consider it's not only that a person may have harmed, their actions may have indirectly caused harm. 
it might have put someone at risk of harm, or they may have attempted to harm someone or failed or incited another person. So also in relevant conduct, we talk about it involves sexual material relating to children, including possession of such material. It involves sexually explicit images depicting violence against human beings, including possession of such images, or as of sexual nature involving a child or vulnerable adult. And then harm. So what I'd like you to think about is, what is harm? And I'd like you to think about your sector. Can you give me some examples of when conduct would harm a child or a vulnerable adult? So if you just want to pop in the chat box and Erin, if you give me some feedback on this one. So when do you think someone's conduct would harm a child or adult? Hopefully you're all thinking and typing away. Can you give me an example of when an individual's conduct might endanger a child or adult by harming them? People must be thinking a lot. I haven't seen anything in the chat box yet. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so, uh, Liam has said a child in a dance class is subjected to body shaming by the teacher or is physically moved from one part of the studio to another. Yeah, that's a really good one. Laura has said forcing a child to do movements which they aren't safely able to do causing injury. Yeah, that's really good. Imogen has said sexualized choreography inappropriate to the age or understanding which is then posted online without knowledge or consent. Yeah. That's said, to knowingly present activity in an unsafe environment. Yeah. So with that one knowingly putting activities on an unsafe environment, that could be putting them at risk of harm as well, because harm doesn't need to have happened at that point. But you might have put by being in an unsafe building or an unsafe environment, you've put them at risk of harm. How about an action that's caused a child or vulnerable adult to be harmed? Alicia's added into the chat, purposefully withdrawing ability for a child to have access to food drink or medical attention if needed during a, during a class. Yeah, that's a really important one, isn't it? Fiona has said physical punishment. Yeah. Imogen has said removal of opportunity as a punishment. Yeah. Sam says overtraining implemented by a teacher. Yeah. Liam's Liam says talking about them to other people. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a lot of those as well fall under harm causing and also putting children at risk of harm. So how about attempting to harm a child or a vulnerable adult? What do you think that could be? Fiona has said grooming and threats. Yeah. Because with attempting to harm a child or vulnerable adult, the harm doesn't need to have occurred, but by the attempt. So you might have attempted to groom, you might have attempted to physically assault somebody, but someone stepped in and stopped you. Just because the harm hasn't happened, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't look at it at DBS. And then we've got incite another to harm a child or a vulnerable adult. What are people thinking for that? 
just one more comment on the attempting to harm. So throwing something at someone and missing. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah, inciting another to harm a child or vulnerable adult. Saying derogatory things about someone to others or uh, feeling or setting up ill feeling against them. Yeah. So it could be examples of encouraging other students to bully children in class. It could be instructing, if you're the principal, instructing teachers to do um, physical punishments, things like that. Some really good examples there to get you thinking. So if we can't satisfy relevant conduct, we think about can we satisfy the, the um, harm test? And by that, we mean where there's behaviour, where there's no evidence of relevant conduct, but there's a sufficient and compelling evidence of a risk of harm to a vulnerable group. The sufficient and compelling evidence of risk must relate to children and vulnerable adults, and it's not the intention for the legislation to extend to people who are at risk to people in general. So again, it's thinking about those harming children, causing harm, putting a child at risk of harm, attempting harm and inciting harm. But also with this one, we need to think of harm doesn't always have to have physically happened. It could be the risk of future harm. So for example, it could be a colleague tells you that they're having thoughts of a sexual nature about the children in their care. They haven't acted on these uh, thoughts, but we would look at that at DBS of, is there a risk of harm in the future to vulnerable groups and consider that risk. So under DBS legislation, there isn't actually a definition of harm. So what we would always say to you is when you think about harm, think about it in the widest context that you can and have a look at what a dictionary definition of harm is. So on the screen here, I've got some examples of harm and abuse, but you know, these aren't all the examples that they're there out there. So we always think about, well, what is harm and what is harm in your sector? So now I'm going to go through a scenario with you. And as I'm reading through this scenario, I'd like you to think about, has there been any harm committed? If so, what was the harm that was committed? And do you think a referral should have been made to the DBS? And if, there were, if, if you think there should have been a referral, when do you think the referral should have been made? So in our scenario, we've got Ms Violet and she's a dance teacher teaching under 16s who attend a prestigious dance school. She's in regulated activity with children. The school launched an investigation into Miss Violet after a 16 year old child A, she coached complained that Miss Violet was bullying them. Several other students were interviewed. Most said that Miss Violet was a brilliant teacher, but they also made some disclosures. They said she would shout, swear, and called her aunt dancers derogatory nicknames during class. She would encourage dancers to continue to train whilst injured and call them weak when they complained of pain. She encouraged dancers to restrict their food in order to lose weight. The dancers all reported that child A would be singled out the most and it had become a running joke within the classes. It was commented more than once that none of them had ever thought to report anything because this, they thought this was normal. And also because Ms Violet had a big say in whether they'd be offered a place in the dance company when they were older. Miss Violet's explanation for this behaviour was that she was trying to make the entire class, including child A, better dancers. 
The school said that if Miss Violet wanted to continue to teach with them, she would need to attend training courses in order to prove her teaching methods, and she would not be allowed to coach on 16s until she had done this. Miss Violet refused and resigned. So if you just want to shout out or pop in the chat box, do you think there has been any harm caused in this scenario? I can see the chat box is popping away there. So lots and lots of yeses there. Yes. And what um, do you think is the type of harm that was happening there? Have a comment of physical and emotional harm. Yeah. Uh, if the child says he or she was harmed, or if there's evidence he or she was harmed, that equals emotional and psychological harm. Yeah. So we could see there was physical harm by the restricting of food, encouraging people to train. She was putting people at risk of harm again when she was um, encouraging people to train when they were injured. But also as well, she was inciting others, wasn't she, when she was encouraging other children to make comments and laughing. So do you think a referral should have been made to DBS at this point? Lots of yeses coming up in the chat box. Yeah, because we've established she was a regulated activity. She has been deemed to have, you know, committed some harm or abuse. And the school have said, yes, if you want to continue to teach, you need to improve your methods. We'll send you on some training. But because she refused and resigned, she has removed herself from regulated activity. So you'd look at that and say, well, actually, if she hadn't resigned, if she'd refused to attend the training, we would have dismissed her. So the school has met the legal duty to make a referral to us at the DBS. So. Moving on, Miss Violet applied for a teaching job at a local dance school near to where she lived. The role was to teach dance to under 18s. They carried out a DBS check, which came back clear. She'd been teaching for a number of years without incident when a member of staff complained to the dance school principal after Miss Violet, after she jointly taught a summer school class with her. The Sant School member of staff witnessed an incident where a child had been unable to keep up with the, with the choreography. Miss Violet yelled at them, threw water over them and made them do star jumps by themselves in front of the, the rest of the class who were encouraged to laugh at them and the child had been visibly upset. All members of the class were spoken to as were previous students and parents. They disclosed that such behaviour was a regular occurrence and when it had been brought up by parents directly to Miss Violet, she had said that these were her teaching methods when she used when she was working at the prestigious dance school. Children also said they didn't want to complain as she promised to introduce them to contacts within professional dance companies, but only if they were tough enough and thin enough. The dance school dismissed Miss Violet and made a referral to the DBS. The DBS then barred Ms. Violet from working in regulated activity with children. So this is just some case studies where you can see if a referral had been made to the DBS earlier on by the original dance school, it would have prevented Ms. Violet from going on to carry on um, you know, committing harm to children and young people. It's just something to keep in mind. So, things to consider. Do you think any harm has been committed by Ms. Violet? Well, certainly straight away you said in the first case there was physical, psychological and emotional harm. I think it was clear in the second case that that was the same. What was the earliest point of referral? An um, earliest point of referral should have been made to the DBS, and like you said, when she resigned from that first dance school. 
and is removing Ms. Violet from teaching dance enough to protect children. What do you think? So say no one else made a referral and she had just been dismissed from dance teaching or had a dance teaching um, qualification suspended. Do you think that would have been enough to protect children? I can see lots of people are saying no, aren't they, Erin? Yeah. <laughs> and that's because you know, Miss Violet could then go on to do another form of work with children and young people. It doesn't necessarily need to be dance. So we're now going to look at the typical barring making decision process. So this is the process that happens when we get referrals into us at the DBS. I'll just have a little flick through my slide here. Right. So as you can see, it's a five stage process and we will close cases at any stage, depending on whether they meet what we are looking at. So our first stage is we call triage and that is when we get our referrals in. First thing we will do is we will look at the case and we will look at does it meet the test for regulated activity? So is the person engaging in regulated activity or are they going to be in the future? We will also look at, has there been relevant conduct or can we satisfy the harm test? So that is stage one. We would then move on to stage two and we will look at what does the information that we've been given tell us? Are there any allegations that we can prove on that balance of probabilities? We will assess all the evidence that we've been given so we can establish the fact. At stage three, we will look at what we call the structured judgment process. And at this point, the caseworkers will answer a series of questions which will assess the risk of harm in the future. So we'll look at what is the risk of harm in the future? How serious is that risk? And would a barring decision be appropriate? be appropriate and proportionate response to that risk. At this stage, we will think of, will we close the case or will we tell the person who we are looking at that we are minded to bar them? And by saying that we're minded to bar them, we're telling them that we're thinking about putting them on one or both of the barred lists. So when we send a letter saying that we're minded to bar for the person, we will ask them for their representations. So stage four is representation. So telling us why you shouldn't be placed on one or both of the barred lists. And also at this stage, we get those relevant offences with representations come into the process. So individuals have eight weeks and two days to tell us why they shouldn't be placed on one or both of the barred lists. And then at stage five, we gather all the information together that we have and we make a decision. And also at this stage, those relevant offences without representations will come in. So we will look at everything that we have got from all the different organisations that made this referral. We'll look at the representations that we've got from the person and decide whether it's appropriate based on future risk to vulnerable groups, whether this person should be placed on one or both of the barred lists. Once we made our decision, the um, person that has been referred will be notified by a letter via recorded delivery that states that they are barred from working with children and or vulnerable adults and the reasons that why we have come to this decision. So people can make appeals to us and the appeals go to the upper tribunal or the care tribunal in Northern Ireland and they have 90 days of the barring decision being made to make the appeal. Appeals can only be made on the grounds that the DBS has made a mistake on any point of law or in any finding of fact on which the decision was based. As I said earlier, a person is placed on the barred list for life, but we do have the power to grant a review, provided that new information is available. So there's been a change in circumstances of the barred individual or there's been an error made by the DBS. So this is the typical barring decision-making process.
We've got a quick question in the chat, yeah. if that's okay. Um, yeah. So when you close a case, do you keep a record of it? And if so, for how long? We do. We keep a record of all the cases. And that could be because when we've closed a case, we've just not had enough evidence or information to prove that this person is a risk enough to place on the barred list. But it might be a few years later, we get another referral about the person. So we'd pull it all together and it can become a bit of a jigsaw. And we go, well, actually, we're now seeing a repeated pattern of behaviour. So now we've got enough evidence to say that this person should be barred. So at the moment, I'm not sure how long the information's kept. Um, we've, we're now 10 years old. So um, all the information for the past 10 years is definitely still kept. Okay, hopefully that's answered your question. I believe so. No more in the chat. Fab. So now we're going to move on to now you know when you've got the legal duty to refer, how can you make a referral to us at the DBS? So there are a few ways that you can make a referral to us. You can register online and do a referral via our online portal. So you can save your referral and complete it later. If you use this method, you can upload electronic documents to support your referral, um, but that is obviously subject to sizes and technical limits. Um, you can use the same form to refer multiple individuals involved in the same incident. Okay, so if you, when you get the slides, you can have a click on the hyperlink and it'll take you to all of those for the portal. You can also go and do a paper referral form. So on our website, you can download a paper referral form and you can save it on your desktop, complete it on, uh, um, on your computer, or if you want to, you can print it out and do it by hand. You can then post the referral form with all the information that given to us um, to our postal address, Wharton Bassett, or alternatively, you can send it to us via email. So you can send us to the contact us at dbs.gov.uk email. Or if you are using an egress account, you can send it to dbsdispatch at dbs.gov.uk. Um, but make sure that you put egress in the subject line so people know why it is coming via that way. So one of the th biggest things that we get asked is how long does it take for a DBS referral to go through? And a lot of how long it takes depends on the quality of the referral because the, um, a referral will take longer to process if we're having to go back to you and ask you for more information. So we need to think about what does a good quality referral look like? So we need to think about have you got enough information to give us so we can act swiftly or are you sending it in too early? So always think about there's a balance to send that swift response to us, but also the balance that you've got enough information for us to make that decision. Please, if you can, complete the, um, the referral form as accurately and fully as you can. If there are any gaps, let us know where the gaps are and why. So, for example, you might not have the individual's date of birth, but you might know who has. So if you know that someone else has got the information we need, put that in the referral form because we'll go out and contact that individual. If you can put a chronology in which detail the sequence of events from your initial notifications of allegations to your final outcome, that's really helpful to help caseworkers put everything in order and know what's going on. Send us all the relevant information that you can to help us make that decision-making process. So all the information that you've got that's relevant to the case, please give it to us. Also, if you can, include what's been the impact on the victim, because quite often these people are forgotten in it, but that'll really help us look at, well, you know, how serious was the action and also what is the risk of future harm. If you can send us those relevant training and supervision records, that's really useful because we can use them as examples of 
yes, they have said that they've committed this act because they weren't sufficiently trained, but then we can look at the safe provision records and dispute that. Or they might, you know, or they said they didn't know, no one's ever told them about anything. This is again, evidence to help us. And then any internal and external investigative and disciplinary processes. So including any interviews, any police intervention or multi-agency meetings. We always say quite often the police won't give you that information. So if they've got information that they won't share with you, tell us about it because we will go to the police and ask for that information. The same with your local authority designated officers. They may not be able to share the meeting minutes with you, but when we request them, they have to share them with us. Um, it's really, really useful to include recruitment information. And that is because we're able to see information about previous job roles. So for example, they might be not only worked with children and regulated activity, they might work with adults and regulated activity in the past. So what we do is we look at that information and go, well, actually, can the harm that's been committed with one group be transferred to another group? So it's really important to include that information and also include any previous records of misconduct or complaints because that helps us build a pattern. So some examples, but it's not exhaustive, are things that we would find useful for you to include when you are making a referral to us. So job descriptions, because immediately a job description will tell us whether the person's in regulated activity or not. The application form that they completed. So as I've just previously mentioned, it's really useful to have an application form because it'll tell us who they've worked with in the past. So like I said, if there's a chance that they may work with vulnerable adults or vulnerable children in the future. Also, if they're a volunteer, the application form will tell us who their current employer is or previous employer is, so we might go out to them for more information. Training records, so again, really, really useful to have relevant and up-to-date training records for people. And that's because if someone, for example, has said, they've committed harm, they've injured somebody, but that was because they weren't taught how to restrain them properly, yet their training record says that they've done restraint training, we then question that. Any witness statements or complaints, they will always help us look to see whether we can make a decision based on the balance of probability, whether the um, allegation has happened or not. Any other records of previous misconduct, helping us build that picture. Information to other organisations who've been informed of the individual's behaviour and any other multi-agency meeting minutes. Like I said, that's really useful because, again, it's helping us make that decision on the balance of probabilities, whether something has happened. Any appraisal information or one-to-one -one meetings discussing the appropriate conduct. Because, again, we can look at, well, what is the person who has committed the conduct saying? then letters inviting people to investigatory meetings, and then any video or photo evidence that you've got of the conduct. Nowadays, a lot of the time, you will see there is videos, CCTV recording things. So you might have video evidence, you might have photographic evidence, you might have photographs of, for example, text message conversations or social media posts that would be part of your investigation send all of that information and if someone does resign send us that resignation letter and um, quite often people will state why they're resigning from a role in the resignation letter so sometimes in a resignation letter someone will refer to the allegation that's being made against them and say whether it's true or false so this list isn't exhaustive but it's just some examples of things we'd like you to include in your referral to us so when you make a referral to us, just a few things that we would like you to consider. So the first one is legibility of written statements. I don't know about you, but when I scribble things down, people wouldn't have a clue what I've written because my handwriting's awful. So we always say, if you've got a written statement, 
what we'd ask you to do is provide a typed up copy of that written statement and then get that signed by the person who wrote the statement to confirm that it's a true account because that'll just save our team coming back to you and saying we can't understand the writing can you give us a written statement think about the quality of the document so if you're scanning information over to us can you make sure that it's readable so for example if you're scanning a photo over can we see what's on that photo um if you're scanning things make sure you're not doing it at an angle where information can be missed and then the final thing to think about is redaction so on the screen here you can see a piece of information that we got from um, an organization about a social worker who had had an inappropriate relationship with a client. As you can see on the screen there, we literally got one line. So using that, we can't make any findings at all based on that redaction because it is so heavily redacted. So in cases like this, we have to go back to the referring agency and ask for unredacted copies. If you do need to redact a copy of a document, make sure that we can distinguish between different or individuals in that. So if you're taking out names, please pull it, for example, child A, child B, parent one, parent two. And that's just so we can see how many different children or individuals are involved in it. And that is because we've had referrals made to us before where all the names are being redacted. So by doing that, we thought there was only one child involved in the case when there was actually four. We do have a team of dedicated caseworkers who will redact everything before we send out information to individuals. Because when we um, are minded to bar an individual, we'll send out what we call the minded to bar bundle. And all that information that we're using to make our decisions will be shared with that individual. But we will always redact that first by the caseworker and then by the redaction team. So you don't need to worry that information that the individual shouldn't know will be shared with them. So if you are making a referral to us, but you're still unsure about what information to supply, please get in touch and ask us and there will be contact details at the end of the presentation. So what is the impact of being barred from regulated activity across the UK jaw restrictions? So as I said earlier at the start, if you're barred in Scotland, the bar also applies to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And if you're barred in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, the bar also applies in Scotland. But for this case today, I'm just talking about DBS. So if you are placed on the children's barred list, you're not allowed to engage in regulated activity with England, Wales or Northern Ireland. You're not allowed, if you place on the adults barred list, you're not allowed to engage in regulated activity with vulnerable adults in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So if you are placed on one or both barred lists, it's actually a criminal offence to work, seek to work or offer to work in regulated activity when you are barred on the relevant list. And it's also a criminal offence to volunteer, seek to volunteer or offer to volunteer in regulated activity when you are barred on the relevant list. And then for you as employers, it's also a criminal offence for a person to permit an individual they know or have reason to believe is barred from regulated activity to engage in regulated activity. So we, this is why we say it's always best practice to get an enhanced for child or adult barred list certificate if you are having people carrying out regulated activity, because otherwise you're not going to know whether they're barred or not. So, you know, you're not going to break the law. So for those criminal offences, it's a maximal penalty of five years imprisonment or a fine. So, for example, if you had someone who came to you to do regulated activity, when you've put in a request to the DBS for a child or adult's barred list check, and it comes back, they are barred in that workforce, it, we'd say, right, you know straight away you cannot employ them, but also because they have committed a crime, you should inform the police of that. So just some final thoughts for you. If you don't make a referral to the DBS, who will? If you don't make a referral to the DBS, 
how are we going to know about this person? If you don't make a referral to the DBS, the person may go on to cause harm to a vulnerable person. If you do make the referral to the DBS, we'll consider all the evidence when deciding whether the person should be barred and we'll only bar people from working with vulnerable groups if it's appropriate and proportionate to do so. So we do have lots of resources on our website for you. So we have some leaflets about how to make a barring referral. We have some guidance, we have our forms, and we also have a little video from the barring team talking about how to make a good quality referral. So how to contact us. So um, if you would like to contact the partnership engagement team, you can either email dbsengagement at dbs.gov.uk or you can email DBS Regional Outreach at dbs.gov.uk. So we have regional outreach workers who are based in each of the regions of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, who are there to give you support at a regional level. If you email the DBS Regional Outreach, it will get to your right person there. We're also on Twitter. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are at dbsgov.uk. We're also on Facebook. If you want to follow us on Facebook, if you just search Disclosure and Barring Service. And there is also further information and help from our barring team. So if you ring our customer services team on the 03000 number, they can help you. Also, you can email the contact us at dbs.gov.uk or have a look at our website. So hopefully today you've been able to understand the benefits of DBS and yourselves working together, understand the three different referral routes, understand when a DBS bar and referral should be made, including when the legal duty to refer is met, understand how to make a good quality referral and have a clear understanding of the consequences of not making appropriate bar and referrals and the consequences of being included in one or both of the barred lists. So thank you very much for listening. I will stop sharing my screen and I will throw it over to some questions. So we have two questions in the chat. Um, so the first question uh, is about uh, investigation of allegations. So the question mm -hmm. is, does this mean you will investigate the allegations even if the referrer has already carried out an investigation and reached a conclusion? So no, we don't carry out any investigations. We just use the information that you've given us when you have completed your investigation for us to make a decision whether that person should be included on one or both of the barred lists. But we may go to other organisations that you have mentioned in your referral to go and ask them more questions and get more information. But we don't then draw a separate conclusion from what you've done. And then the second question was around whether or not it would be relevant to refer someone if they had not resigned um, or were or the organization wasn't planning to dismiss them from regulated activity. So this is where if you feel there's a safeguarding reason, you could then make that referral to us and we would have to look at it. But you'd be best taking your own legal advice to say, well, what grounds have we got to refer this person? if we haven't removed them from regulated activity. Brilliant, that's all the questions I can currently see in the chat. Oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> um, one question, in the 10 year history of the organization, have you found an increase in referrals at, and any sectors in particular? So it really changes and I think what we're finding as a regional team, as our teams are becoming embedded in regions, we're getting more referrals as people are becoming more aware within their regions. Or if we target a sector, we will get more referrals as people become more aware of their legal duty to refer. We will find things will increase, referrals will increase when there has been um, high publicity around things. So at the moment, obviously, there has been lots of investigations in terms of the um, ICSA reports just come out. So we're expecting that's gonna have an impact on historical referrals. We know that when reports come out, such as like the White Report, you will go, oh, right, that's um, made us think, we better go and look at all our historical cases. We do have organizations that have gone back and looked 
and made 200 referrals to us on the back of we, we, maybe we should have made these referrals in the past so yeah another question in the chat if we hear something about someone which isn't directly related to the regulated activity they do with us and we have no authority or facility to investigate it and it gives us cause for concern can we refer it to the dbs you could make a referral to dbs under safeguarding um but you probably be best speaking to your local authority designated officer or that person's employer directly um to get more information before we could look at it because you might just send us information in whereas we wouldn't be able to do much with it because we have we can't investigate it so i'd say you could because you can, anyone can make a referral to dbs and we have to look at it but it might be your first option to speak to either the police or the local authority designated officer thank you kathy um really really fascinating talk. i do have a question uh, and this is something that i read in the in the paper a while ago can somebody change their name by depot and therefore get around this bar no so there is people changing their names um, but when you submit a DBS um, application, you have to, to give evidence of all names that you've had in the past. Um, so they shouldn't be able to go around this loophole. At the moment, there is um, a review going on about DBS process and legislation. And know this is one of the things that is, you know, being flagged up on there. So we will hopefully have a solution to say, this definitely won't happen. And I think it is a concern that people are having, um, definitely in terms of sex offenders changing their names coming up, you know, really high profile in the media. But really, if people are submitting their checks correctly, they should be disclosing all previous names and that would then come up. So, Albeit or, or there's no incentive for a sex offender to disclose properly. No, but this is where we would be relying on organisations to do their due diligence about a person as well. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, do we have any more any more questions? I can't see any, any in the chat. Just, um, sorry, I, I've random question, but has anyone been prosecuted for not referring? We have, we would rather talk to people than prosecute them. So I know certainly my team, before we would go down a prosecution route, our team will be contacted and asked to go and do an educational piece with them. Okay, so because I'm sure there's a few examples in the Exeter report historically of um, moving people around in churches, etc., uh, rather than uh, disclosing and uh, making it public. Yeah, so we are working really hard with all the sectors at the moment to really raise the awareness of the legal duty to refer. Okay. Thank you, Cathy. Um, any further questions in the chat or you can raise your electronic hand because there's many people being panellists now, uh, which is good, you're all behaving well. Uh, one for Imogen. Um, would it be your advice that whilst the DBS can do so much to assist with protecting people, that organisations should check references as well? Definitely. DBS checks are only a really small part of your safer recruitment practices. You know, DBS checks will only tell you conviction history, criminal history, police intelligence, and barred list status. They won't tell you if there's been low level concerns about an individual in a previous organization. So, you know, we really would say, think about your reference references. It's a really big one. Think about your references, especially for volunteers. Think about how you recruit volunteers. And, um, you know, a lot of people will go, well, they don't have a job description, they don't have an application form to fill in. And you might go, oh, well, I know this person, I know such and such from down the road. So it means that I don't need to do due diligence about them. This person's been a teacher for 20 years. That means they're fine. You need to always do your reference checks. Thank you. Uh, another one in the um, chat from Liam. Sorry, Aaron, I've taken over. I was just saying thank you and, and the questions <laughs> kept coming. Um, in the first example involving Miss Violet, the organisation had reached an outcome, upheld the allegations and decided not to dismiss the teacher, but the teacher resigned. Does that mean you don't have to dismiss the person to refer them in these circumstances? So when we look at the conditions to refer, it's you've removed them from regulated activity. So dismissal, 
redeployed them. And then if they resign a major redundant or retire, you would then look at if they hadn't retired, be made redundant or resigned, would you have removed them from regulated activity? If the answer was yes, at that point, you've made that legal duty to make a referral. So a person resigning doesn't mean that the situation's all good because they've gone away. It's not your problem anymore. It's you need to think of, well, actually, no, just because they've resigned doesn't mean they're not going to commit harm in another organisation. So you can still make that referral. Yeah. It's worth also mentioning the difference between having something on your DBS check and being barred. Because yes. um, there's, I mean, I work in teacher training and uh, we never promise the DBS checks are empty, but we have a protocol if something's on it and we decide if it is recent, relevant and um, recent, serious and relevant to children. Yeah. So you could have something 30 years ago when somebody was caught shoplifting. Um, and then we do, we do a risk assessment based on that and, and pass them through. Yeah. So when there is information on a DBS certificate, it doesn't mean that you cannot have this person working or volunteering with you unless it's a barred status on their regulated activity because I can't even remember how many million people in the UK have got criminal record and you know just having a criminal record doesn't make you a suitable person so we always say if there's information on DBS certificate do a thorough risk assessment of that so for example it might be and I know this from an organization I've worked with in the past um, someone had um, benefit fraud on their DBS check. Well, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be a good youth worker. So that was taken into account and all the circumstances around it looked at and discussed. You'll find certain professions will attack people with um, lived experience, as we like to call it. Um, for example, substance misuse counselling. You might find people that have previously misuse substances go into counselling because they've got that lived experience and quite often there might be criminal records on there so we always say treat individual case by case basis you can't make a blanket decision unless they are barred and only at that point you can make a blanket decision. Thank you um, there's a, a follow-up to Liam's question about the one where the teacher resigned because the organisation hadn't made a decision to dismiss them and they were going to set conditions. Does that mean they, they shouldn't have referred? So again, this is a difficult one because if they have kept the person in regulated activity, they haven't met the legal duty to make the referral. But if there is safeguard of concerns, they can still make that referral. Thank you. And you'll, you'll find that some organisations will make a referral saying, well, we'll then make the decision to dismiss once the DBS have decided, but really you should make that decision before you refer to us. Yeah, thank you. Right, we're coming towards the, the end of our, uh, of our 90 minutes. Um, uh, I will pause questions now. So thank you uh, for everybody. Thank you for your attendance.